Hello, I'm Jane Goodall, and I'm here to present the story of traditional communities on two continents, South America and Africa, sharing experiences and struggling to have a real say in what will happen to their homes, the magnificent Amazon forest and the inspiring landscapes and forests of East Africa. When I first arrived in Gombe on July the 14th, 1960, nearly 50 years ago, there was forest stretching as far as the eye could see, meeting up with other forests in Burundi along the eastern Rift Valley. From my perch in the forest, I often heard chimpanzees calling from the other side of the rift. Every morning, I would leave camp and follow the same path. I'd climb the same hill and sit in the same spot and hope. In the decades after my research began at Gombe, deforestation in the region increased dramatically as a result of the increase of local population and demand for farmland and timber. It's only in recent years that it's been possible to estimate where and how much of the forest around Gombe has been destroyed. And that is thanks to GIS support from ESRI and satellite imagery from Digital Globe. Local people, using this advanced imagery, have been able to map their houses, streams, footpaths and sacred areas. In the Amazon state of Rondonia in Brazil, another local community has faced a similar reality. It was only 40 years ago, in 1969, that the Surui's once impenetrable rainforests were opened up by the building of the Amazon Highway, BR-364. In the following years, the Surui population decreased from 5,000 to 290 people due to disease and violent confrontations. Around their traditional lands, the forest was disappearing at ever faster rates, and illegal loggers were invading the limits of their lands. Even today, 4,000 direct jobs depend on the illegal timber taken from indigenous lands in the region. In 1992, realizing that their people would not survive without their forests and that something needed to be done, the Surui tribe elected a young man to lead them. Today, the Surui are working to monitor their forests by combining state-of-the-art technologies along with their traditional knowledge of the forest. They've already mapped how they use and see the forest. Using technologies such as Google Earth, they're now able to share their perspective with the rest of the world. Earning carbon credits for avoiding deforestation is one of the first ways that the global community can pay for some of the ecosystem services provided by the world's forests. It's also a direct way to compensate local communities, provide green job opportunities, and support their efforts to best manage and preserve their own forests. Realizing that they could not complete their plans on their own, Chief Almir turned to the internet and the Surui set out to find partners spread throughout the world. In 2008, Chief Almir met the Google Earth outreach team, who've provided training on how to use Google Earth and other technologies. Today, the Surui coordinate advanced programs, such as the Surui Carbon Project, together with several organizations, including Forest Trends, Caninde, IDESAM, and the Amazon Conservation Team. In the same way, local communities in Uganda and Tanzania have partnered with the Jane Goodall Institute to develop their own carbon projects. In Uganda, 
Charles Tondo and Osman Amula of JGI Uganda are using Google Android with the local communities on a privately owned natural forest. They're setting up forest plots for carbon monitoring and hope to use carbon credits as incentives to other private owners. They hope to save the last forest patches outside the protected areas and corridors for chimpanzees and other wildlife in the Hoima region. In Tanzania, Ashahadu Jumani from the village of Magaraganza was selected by his community's government as a forest monitor. Jumane is one of more than 40 village forest monitors from 35 villages in the Gombian Masito Ogala ecosystem who've been trained by JGI to use GPS and collect data on their forest and wildlife. By using these technologies and the internet, these communities will be able to interact directly with the global community and demonstrate unequivocally the concrete benefits of their work. In this way, local information can directly inform and influence global decision-making, such as here at Copenhagen. We need to listen to the voices coming out of the forests and pay attention to the solutions that are being presented. It's a unique opportunity created by unique partnerships that started with the community and extended around the world. And now, to this audience here in Copenhagen.